What is up guys, Sean here, and today we're going to talk about Francis Maxwell. Again. First things first, I want to thank Joseph for donating to me in my last stream. I didn't thank you in the stream because I didn't realize you had donated, so thank you very much, dude. So I've covered Francis Maxwell before. He's actually one of these Instagram models that works for the Young Turks that's all about self-promotion, but he tends to play fast and loose with the facts to promote his SJW narrative. If you have not seen it yet, I did a previous video where I did an in-depth breakdown of a Francis Maxwell video where I showed that every single case he presented he got key facts wrong in all of them. That'll be linked in the description. But without further ado, let's get into this new video. He released Rossfeld on a $250,000 unsecured bond. All right, first things first, I just have to point this out. The Young Turks is a YouTube channel with 3.9 million subscribers. But for some reason, I'm watching a video that is clearly a TV being recorded by a cell phone. Dude, download the clips. It's not that hard. You guys clearly have money behind your organization. How about some production value? Police Rossfeld on a $250,000 unsecured bond. Now that means Rossfeld, as you heard, did not have to put up any money for his release. Okay, so the first clip is about the officer that shot Antoine Rose. For those of you who don't know, Antoine Rose is the latest person being portrayed as an innocent victim of racist policing and mur violent murder. And what people like Francis Maxwell on the left tell you about Antoine Rose is that he was shot in the back while he was unarmed. What they leave out is that Antoine Rose and a friend were committing a drive-by shooting just 10 minutes before the car that they were in was pulled over. And while he and his buddy did decide to leave their guns in the car, there was no way for the officer to know that. So any reasonable officer put in that situation could assume that Antoine Rose and his friend were armed. Oh my God, we're 15 seconds in and we're talking about the dude who popped the willy. Is this gonna be Meek Mill? Like, cause I've already debunked the fact that Meek Mill had his parole violated based on popping a willy. Meek Mill's case has denied his request for bail. The judge, mm -mm -mm. Denise Brinkley, says that he's a flight risk and he is a danger to the community. In fact, I've specifically debunked this when Francis Maxwell used it in his other video. How many Americans are there again? Oh, that's right, there's two. One in which a white police officer named Michael Rosfeld can face homicide charges for shooting an unarmed black teen three times in the back, only to be released without having to pay a single damn penny in bail. But in the other America, the one where the racist justice system is programmed to cripple people of color, you all remember Meek Mill, right? Yeah, the, the justice system is programmed to attack people of color. Meek Mill was put in jail, violated his parole, for popping a willy. That that was all he did. You all remember Meek Mill, right? The rapper sent back to jail for violating parole? Yeah, he was denied bond for popping a wheelie in the same state. All right, since Francis Maxwell and the people who support Meek Mill need this to be explained again, I will. Meek Mill was already on parole, meaning that he was convicted of a violent felony. This happened a little under a decade ago. During that time, Mill violated his parole over and over and over again. These violations included testing positive for drugs, leaving the state when he was not permitted to, and other miscellaneous violations of that parole. Now, during the course of this eight year span, when Meek Mill was consistently violating his parole, he was not punished at all for it. He was continually given warnings and basically given a slap on the wrist each and every time he did a parole violation. So after eight years of consistently violating his parole, he finally pushed the judge too far and she actually decided to invoke a parole violation. In fact, it's publicly available for everyone to read what the judge said as she was passing the sentence on Meek Mill when she decided to actually violate his parole and make him serve his sentence. Now, of course, I will link that below, but the abridged version goes like this. Dude, I've given you chance after chance after chance. You continually violate your parole. You spit on the chances that this court gives you. So you know what? This time you're not gonna get a free pass. If it's racism to give Meek Mill eight years worth of free passes and free chances, and then finally, after the long train of abuses of his parole, violate him, then sign me up for that racist treatment. I would love to commit a felony and then not have to go to prison for eight years and get like 12 strikes. 
That's where you get the likes of Khalif Browder, who you remember was falsely accused of stealing a backpack and spent three years in prison in Rickles Island, some of that time in solitary confinement. When he faced the theft charges, his bail was set at $3,000 initially, which his family struggled but then managed to raise enough to pay for. But of course, in that America, it doesn't matter because the judge later changed his mind and decided to deny bail altogether. Oh my God, finally, he actually brought up a legitimate bad case, Khalif Browder. So let me ask you, in what world is someone who is falsely accused of theft sent to one of the most brutal prisons in the world? Rikers Island is not one of the most violent prisons in the world, just so you guys know. In fact, Rikers Island is not a prison, it's actually a jail. Jails hold people who are convicted of misdemeanors and people awaiting trial. So of course, even when Francis Maxwell gives a good example of something bad that happened to a black person in the criminal justice system, he is again wrong about the facts. So let me ask you, in what world is someone who is falsely accused of theft sent to one of the most brutal prisons in the world, resulting in years of torment to the point where he took his own life while a man who committed homicide on camera is allowed to enjoy the comfort of his own home while he awaits trial. Now I know, I'm well prepared that the race deflectors will respond with the different state, different rules to remove that discomfort they feel when faced with injustice. I like how Francis Maxwell calls it race deflection to say that different states have different rules. No dude, that's actually a fact. I know you're not familiar with facts, but that's a true statement. I know, I'm well prepared that the race deflectors will respond with the different state, different rules to remove that discomfort they feel when faced with injustice. So since you brought up rules, let's have a look at what the state of Pennsylvania's constitution says. If you're charged with a crime where the maximum sentence is life in prison, you are not entitled to bond. Well, that's interesting. I mean, it's written plain and simple. I wonder why the judge chose to handle this homicide with kid gloves. Let's look at what he had to say. I'm not going to defend myself to anyone except to God and the president judge. Okay. I honestly kind of appreciate how these videos are constructed. Like clearly they're made to fool the dumbest people in the world and they have obvious tricks in them. Like Francis Maxwell saying, well, speaking of rules, Here's a rule from Pennsylvania's constitution. And then he shows a clip of a more combative portion of the judge's statement to make it seem like he's defending himself from the charge that he violated Pennsylvania's state constitution by not denying the officer bail. And like any good magician or deception artist, we've pivoted from three topics, from three things that he's showing you portions of in a matter of seconds. We went from Khalif Browder to rules to Pennsylvania's constitution to the back end of a judge's quote. Now what Pennsylvania's constitution says is that if you are charged with a crime, that's a capital offense, which is the death penalty, or where the maximum penalty is life in prison, then you are to be denied bond. And then Francis points out that the officer was charged with criminal homicide and then moves directly to the back end of the judge's quote. But here's the problem with that. Criminal homicide in the state of Pennsylvania is not a specific charge. In fact, it is a category of charges. Now, some of the charges that fall under the umbrella of criminal homicide carry a life sentence. Now, what happens when you're arraigned is that the prosecutor presents charges and the judge reviews them to see if there's probable cause to charge you with that crime. When you review the statement of the prosecutor, you find that even the prosecutor believes that this is only worthy of a third degree murder charge. The maximum penalty for a third degree murder charge is 40 years in prison not life because the idea that this officer committed a premeditated act of homicide and wasn't reacting to the situation potentially reacting poorly to the situation by shooting a suspect running away is an absurd notion how many times does white privilege have to slap people in the face before they realize this is exactly what the system is programmed to do? It's not broken because for something to be broken, it would have to have worked in the first place. Countless Americans of color are held without bond for minor charges and forced to spend long stretches of time behind bars before they're even given a chance to plead their case. Meanwhile, officers like Rossfeld are protected and coddled despite facing a life sentence for killing a 17 year old. So what we have here is Francis Maxwell deceiving his audience yet again. He shows you a portion of the Pennsylvania constitution, ignores the fact that this portion of the constitution doesn't apply, and then tells you that white officers get to violate what's ironclad and in the law. Bring both of these examples to your attention because they represent similar cases? No, because there is no similarity here. There's video footage in one instance of an officer with a past history of gross misconduct shooting Antoine Rose in the back, 
while on the other Khalif Browder was wrongfully accused of theft. Now the Browder case is an awful case, of course, no doubt about it. However, its placement in this video is demonstrative of Francis Maxwell's strategy of cherry picking and of the disproportionate attention that black victims of the criminal justice system get. Because it turns out unsurprisingly, when you look into New York City's treatment of juveniles, the Browder case sadly is not unique. Ryan Dufert was arrested at 15 years old in connection to a homicide in the Queens area. Full disclosure, before I get into this story about Ryan Dufert, I do have to say he was a childhood friend of mine so take that for whatever you think it's worth. He was denied bond and held in Rikers Island for five years awaiting trial, which means that Dufert missed his high school graduation, his prom, his 18th birthday. He spent all that time, he basically grew up in Rikers Island. Dufert's family went through 37 different adjournments to try and get their son out, but they could not do it. And when the case finally went to trial, five years after the initial arrest, it was revealed that the witness that identified Dufert actually never identified him as a participant in the crime. Now, Dufert was found not guilty by the jury and subsequently released, but he was still robbed of five years of his life due to the fact that he was accused of a crime and he was denied bail awaiting trial. Like Browder, this wasn't a case of him being wrongfully convicted. He was wrongfully accused. So their lives were destroyed despite the fact that they should have had a presumption of innocence. There have been subsequent investigations into district attorneys in New York that have found that a number of juveniles have been held in the city of New York without bond for years while awaiting trial. Now Dufert, like many other examples that I could pull from kids who get lost in the juvenile system in the city of New York, wasn't black. He's actually half Asian, half white, which unsurprisingly is probably why his story was a local story, even though he was held in jail longer than Browder. And that's why I thought it was important for me to bring that up. Because when you actually make apples to apples comparisons, and you're not trying to push a narrative by cherry picking this case here and that case here, you actually find that there are problems in the criminal justice system, that people do get mistreated. A ton of people get lost in the system, and a lot of times they don't have a recourse to get themselves out. And that's definitely a problem. But I'm a big believer that in order to actually solve a problem, you have to address it properly. Blaming all the problems in the criminal justice system on racism and using cherry pick data to support your claim won't solve any of the actual problems in the criminal justice system. Anyway, that's all I really have for you guys today. Special thanks to my patrons, Pepe Loves Trump, Louis Cool Dance, Apollo Legend, Alec, Mike Barbarossa, Tina, Chelsea, Michael, and Christopher Morang. Like, share, subscribe, you know all the nonsense. Till next time.